Hello, everybody. Good to be with you yet again. Well, uh, we've finally made it to the Gospels. We're going to look at some Bible now. I really appreciate that we're like, what, seven weeks into our Foundations of the Faith series. And I think that it's been really important for us to have taken that long to get to the Bible because this series is intended for helping you talk to non-Christians, people who won't accept the Bible as an authoritative text. And so we need to meet them where they are. So it's taken this long, but we're finally there. We're going to look at the Bible and we're going to be asking ourselves the question today, are the Gospels contradictory or complementary? Because often you'll hear that the Bible, yeah, we've dealt with like all the manuscript differences, but we'll hear that the Bible is full of contradictions. If the gospel accounts are full of contradictions, then that causes us perhaps a problem if we're trying to use them as a basis for our faith. So let's have a think about some of these, uh, these contradictions and then we'll have a look at some of the other stuff as well. Now, famously, back in 1912, you may remember or have heard of a, a little ship called Titanic that sank in the Atlantic. The reports from eyewitnesses after the sinking were quite interesting because some of them said that the Titanic broke in two on the way down and others said that it remained intact as it went down. That was a contradiction between eyewitnesses. But did it matter? Not really, because the vital elements of the, the story that they were telling were the same, i.e., they all agreed that the Titanic sank. It was just the fine detail of how it sank that they were disagreeing on. A lot of the contradictions that we see in the Gospel accounts are kind of similar to that. They, they may appear to be contradictions on the surface, but actually they're just the fine detail of, of what was going on. Some contradictions can just be swept away straight away. For example, um, the women who came to the tomb on Easter Day. Did they run away frightened and not tell anyone, like Mark records in his gospel? Or did they run to tell the men and, uh, and have Peter and John come to the tomb as the other gospels recount? Well, if we think about it, they must have told somebody because otherwise nobody else would have known you see, it's quite possible that, well, there are two possible reasons for Mark's gospel ending the way it does. One is the suggestion that the end of the manuscript has just got lost over the years because it fell off and has never been found. Uh, the other option, which I tend to lean towards, is that actually Mark deliberately left it as a, sort of a cliffhanger of what's going to happen next. Who did they tell? Are you going to go and investigate? Either way, the fact that the Christian message was perpetuated, that the disciples did see the empty tomb, shows that they must have told somebody. So although it appears a contradiction on the surface, it's just that Mark is leaving us with a cliffhanger. Another example of a contradiction would be when Jesus sends out the disciples on a mission trip. In Mark's account, then the disciples are told to take their staff and their sandals. In Luke and Matthew's version of the uh, of the account, then then they're not allowed to take their stuff and sandals. Jesus says, "Don't take stuff and sandals." Again, it sounds like a contradiction, and in a sense it is. But you can understand what Jesus was getting at. He was saying, "Don't hang around. Don't go and get extra provisions. Don't go out to the shops and buy some more stuff for the journey. Just get on the road. Get out there, sharing the message, telling people that I'm coming around and that the day of the Lord is at hand and that that they are witnessing Messiah coming." It again, it's yes, it's a contradiction. No, it doesn't make any difference. Another thing that we've got to bear in mind when we are reading the Gospels is that by necessity, then the Gospel writers were interpreting Jesus' words because they were translating from Aramaic that Jesus would have been speaking in. It was the lingua franca, uh, fran 
lingua franca of the day. Uh, and so they would be translating into Greek, which was the written lingua franca, whatever the equivalent is in writing, I don't know. Anyway, we get things in the Sermon on the Mount, like in Luke, with his Sermon on the Plain, you get blessed are the poor. In Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount, we have blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, again, there's a couple of possibilities. Maybe they're different accounts. Jesus was on the road for three years teaching and preaching. It's quite possible that on different occasions he said the same sort of thing in different ways. But it's also possible that Matthew was wanting to draw out in his interpretation of the Aramaic uh, then the idea of being poor in spirit rather than just poor. Either way, we know that people who don't have a lot are blessed by God. And that's nice. What else is there? Well, um, uh, Jesus' death. Then we have Matthew and Mark recording that the centurion who was on duty said, surely this was the Son of God. Luke's version has him just saying, surely this was a righteous man. Now, again, the, it's possible that, that it's just the way that different people in different places heard what was said. It's possible that Luke was trying to draw out a specific inference uh, from what the centurion said, that uh, it was about the righteousness of Jesus as the pure Lamb of God, whereas Matthew and Mark wanted to be more explicit and point to Jesus' divinity as the Son of God. Either way, it's worth bearing in mind that the authors of the Gospels were writing to different groups of people and for different reasons. And so it's not surprising that they remember things differently and address them differently. There are other sets of contradictions um, which kind of fall into a general category, like uh, were the two demon-possessed men that met with Jesus on one occasion, as it recorded in Matthew 8, or one, as recorded in Mark 5, uh, were the two blind men that Jesus healed on an occasion, in, recorded in Matthew 20, or is it one that was mentioned in Mark 10, were the two angels at the tomb, as recorded in Luke 24, uh, or one, as recorded in Mark. And you'll notice that each of those, the shorter version, is in Mark. And Mark is constantly kind of the most dramatic sort of, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and immediately they did this, and then they went there, and they did that. Mark kind of has this laser focus. He wants to get on with the story. So it makes sense that he would only focus in on the one that did the most talking or the one that was most well-known to his audience. Whereas Matthew and Luke were kind of giving a fuller account of the story. So likewise, it makes sense that they would take time to note that there were other people around too. But maybe one of them did most of the talking. The important thing to note with all of these things is that differences are not contradictions. For example, if I said this morning, I did some work in the garden. And I also said to somebody this morning, I didn't work in the garden. That's a contradiction. Whereas if to one person I say, I worked in the garden this morning, and to another person I said, this morning I tidied up the lawn and planted some bulbs and made sure everything had enough water. Well, for a start, they'd know that I was lying because Catherine does most of the work in the garden. But apart from that, they would know that I had been working in the garden. They're different, but they're not contradictory. And you know, it's actually a good thing that the Gospels do have differences. The girls are currently into a thing called Princess Detectives on YouTube. And if a detective interviewed four witnesses to an event, and they all said exactly the same thing, that detective would probably presume that there's a cover-up going on. But if the witnesses were all in broad agreement with the general brushstrokes of what happened, but they varied on the detail, they saw different things, they heard slightly different version events, they remember things in different ways, those details that are different, they're a good sign that what they're recording is authentic. 
and that they're telling the truth in their accounts. And it gets better because not just do we have these differences, but we also have some awesome stuff called unintended uh, or undesigned coincidences. They're also known as elaborate testimony. Now, these are things where a puzzle is posed by one gospel and it's answered by another independently. It's really exciting stuff. I love it. So you'll get like uh, in Matthew 14, Herod, we're told that Herod Antipas says to his servants, this man, Jesus, is John the Baptist who's been raised from the dead. Well, how did Matthew know what Herod had been saying in the privacy of his own palace to his servants? Well, we're told in Luke 8 that there were a bunch of women who were following Jesus, and it says that Joanna was one of these women, and Joanna, it says, is the wife of Chuzza, Herod's steward. So you see, Luke answers this question that Matthew raises. Matthew asks, how did, uh, or Matthew's account raises the question, how did uh, Matthew know about what Herod said? And Luke answers, because there was an inside source that Herod's steward's wife followed Jesus. She was in the crowd. She'd have told them what was going on in the palace. Another great example, it's kind of a, uh, um, a three-way one, this one. So in Matthew 11, then Jesus is, is kind of uh, ranting. I'm sure there's a more holy word than that. He's telling off Bethsaida. He's saying, if the miracles that had been done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, then they would have repented. But Matthew didn't tell us of any miracles that took place in Bethsaida. So what's this, what's this outburst about? Well, if we look in John chapter 6, then we get to the feeding of the 5,000, and Jesus says to Philip, hey, Phil, where are we going to get the bread to feed all these people? Now, Philip is, hey, I love Philip, but he's not one of the major disciples. Okay? He's not Peter, he's not James or John, he's not in the inner circle. So why is, why is Jesus asking Peter where to get bread to feed all these people? Well, in Luke chapter 9, then we're told that the feeding of the 5,000 was in Bethsaida. And we're told in John 1 that, that Philip is from Bethsaida. So you see, Phil's got the local knowledge of where to get the bread. We're told that, it's in, that it happened in Bethsaida by Luke, and that is why in Matthew, Jesus says, if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the miracle taking place, then they'd have repented. One more. There are loads, but one more. In John chapter 21, there's a passage that's very familiar and very well loved by people where Jesus kind of reinstates Peter. He takes him for a walk on the beach after they've been through a barbecue. And he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Why, why, why does he say, do you love me more than these? Well, the answer we find in Matthew's gospel. Because in Matthew 26... Then Peter's there bragging when Jesus says, you know, they will strike the shepherd and the sheep will run away. And Peter stands up and says, even if all the others run away, I will never run away. What does he do? He runs away. And in, in John, we seem to say, so, do you love me more than these? Really? See, Matthew's gospel fills in the blanks that John's gospel poses. We see this time and time again in the Bible, uh, where there are these undesigned coincidences, things that, uh, that can't have been foreplanned, because they're little silly details, but they all dovetail in to create this whole. So the contradictions that are there and the differences add to the authenticity of the accounts. They don't detract from it, and they certainly don't harm any doctrine. And the undesigned, unintended coincidences show that the Gospels are an authentic and trustworthy record of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Now we're getting into the real theology stuff here, uh, the biblical theology stuff. And next week we'll be looking at how we go from accepting that, or acknowledging at least, that the Bible is trustworthy 
to presenting the gospel. Until then, take care and God bless.